Good evening. This is a meeting of the Athens Board of Zoning Appeals. The time is 7.03 uh, p.m. and the date is Tuesday, March 10, 2020. At this time, I will call the meeting to order. The board consists of five members and two alternates. The alternates taking full part in the discussions and becoming a voting member in the absence of a member or when a member abstains for conflict of interest. Uh, present tonight are members Ms. Lisa Carson, um, Ms. Kay Towsley, and alternates are Aaron Thomas and Mr. Robert Delac. And unless we have one more member attending, uh, both of you will be voting members tonight. Also present are zoning administrator Mr. David Riggs. Uh, Secretary, Mr. Paul Eschenbacher, and we are also pleased to have uh, Ms. Uh, Lisa Eliason, the law director, uh, who will be providing a training for us at the end of the meeting. Uh, at this time, I invite you to view a pre-recorded video on the rules and procedures of the board. The, the Athens, Athens Board, board of Zoning, zoning Appeals, appeals operates, operates according, according to the, the following, following procedure. procedure. The, the chair will name and describe, describe the case. case. The zoning administrator or secretary will state the basis of the objection and any applicable facts or conditions pertaining to the case. The appellant or their representative will give reason why the appeal should be viewed favorably. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of the request will be heard. Anyone wishing to speak in general comment will be heard. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition will be heard. If necessary, the appellant or their representative will offer concluding summary or rebuttal remarks. Testimony from the floor shall be closed. The board will deliberate and render a decision. According to Athens City Code section 23.07.03b, the board has power to grant variances from the strict application of the code provided the variance will not be contrary to the public interest. The spirit of the code is observed Public safety and welfare are secured, and substantial justice is done. According to Athens City Code, Section 23.07.10c, variances from the code shall not be granted unless the board makes specific findings of fact, based directly on the particular evidence presented to it, that the standards and conditions imposed in this title, if applicable, have been met by the applicant. Exceptional circumstances. There are exceptional or extraordinary circumstances or conditions applying to the property in question or to the intended use of the property that do not apply generally to other properties or classes or uses in the same zone. Practical difficulty and undue hardship. Because of exceptional or extraordinary circumstances or conditions pertaining to a specific piece of property, a literal enforcement of these regulations will result in practical difficulty or undue hardship that is unnecessary to the achievement of public purposes. Preservation of equal property rights. Literal interpretation of these regulations would deprive the appellant of rights commonly enjoyed by others in the same zone and the same vicinity. While a granting of the requested variance will not confer on the applicant any special privilege that is denied to other properties in the same zone and the same vicinity. Minimum variance. The variance granted is the minimum variance required to make possible the reasonable use of the property. Absence of detriment. The authorizing of such variance will not be of substantial detriment to adjacent property and will not materially impair the purpose of the zoning code or the public interest. Not of a general nature. The condition or situation of the specific piece of property or the intended use of said property for which variance is sought, one or the other or in combination, is not of so general or recurrent a nature as to make reasonably practicable the formulation of a general regulation for such condition or situation. Any person, resident or officer, department or appointed body of the City of Athens aggrieved by a decision of the board may petition the Athens County Court of Common Pleas concerning the illegality of the decision. Such petition must be filed within 30 days after the mailing of the decision of the board to the applicant. Thank you. 
uh, there is only one case on tonight's agenda, and that is the property at 19 South Congress Street. Uh, we have also amended the agenda to add a meeting with the City of Athens Law Director, Ms. Lisa Eliason. Uh, do we need to take a vote on that? I can just see here. Leave them as is. Okay. Uh, so that would be at the end of our uh, presentation tonight. The board is required to take testimony under oath. Uh, would anyone wishing to speak concerning any items on the agenda please stand? Uh, do you swear or affirm that any testimony you will present to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Be seated, please. Also, we have our uh, board member, uh, Mr. John Goodikins, uh, just arrived. So he will be a voting member. And Robert, maybe next time. <laughs> um, here. Okay, we have case number 20-2V. And the property is at 19 South Congress Street. Zone is R3. And Mr. Trent De Bruin. Oh, okay, okay. But uh, Mr. Trent De Bruin is uh, listed as the appellant uh, for this meeting. Appellant is requesting a variance from ACC 2310-01, Table A, a schedule of bulk controls to allow remodeling of buildings resulting in 44% building lot coverage, where 40% building lot coverage is the maximum allowed. Uh, the code office, or Mr. Reschenbacher? Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Now go ahead if you have I any comments. I just want to say, of course, when we go through these, there are two different kinds of lot coverage. There's the building lot coverage, which is just the buildings themselves, accessory structures and stuff. Total lot coverage is the buildings plus anything that's paved. Okay. Uh, with this thing, with the additions they want to add that puts the building lot coverage over 44%, the total lot coverage will be at 60, which is the maximum allowed. So the only variance they need is for the building lot coverage. Okay. Okay. Uh, so my question was like, uh, in general, maybe not with this case, if you have a balcony which is off the ground, would that be considered as lot coverage? Um, it depends on the size of the balcony. Okay. If it's over the length of the wall, then it is. Oh, okay. All right, any other questions for the, yes, hey? Uh, this reference is remodeling of buildings, plural. Is that an error? No, well, all we know about is that they're doing the front house there. Maybe Mr. Model can specify what they're doing. All we have is that. If there's any remodeling going in the other two buildings, it didn't require a permit from us or any variances. Any other questions? Well, sir, you may come to the podium and state your name and address for the records and also your relationship with Mr. Trent De Bruyne. Are you representing him? Or? Um, I'm the property owner. Uh, oh, Mr. Okay. De Bruyne was presenting. It was for me, yeah, as the architect. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank my, you. my name is Kurt Montel. Uh, I reside at 74 Elmwood Place here in Athens, Ohio. Um, my wife and I recently purchased the property we're discussing at 19 South Congress Street from a Mr. Jack Stauffer here at the beginning of the year. And uh, as we normally do, we're going through the property and, and upgrading it as we see it is necessary. Um, the structure in question has three apartments, uh, two of which use that front shared entrance that you see. Um, the improvement that we're talking about, the primary area, the balcony area, is approximately a four foot by ten foot area. Uh, we propose adding a lower and an upper balcony, so two of the apartments that use the shared entrance each apartment would have a balcony coming off of its living room area. Um, the footprint of the building, as I said, is, is about four foot by 10 foot area that we're discussing. Uh, primary materials for construction 
We're going to be using block with a brick facade. Um, we are also proposing uh, residing the entire house um, with cement fiberboard siding as well uh, during this process. Um, we're asking to achieve what the majority of our neighbors have, which is a covered exterior area, a porch, balcony area, um, like the beta house that's adjacent to us. Um, in their in surrounding properties across from us, the majority of those are houses that have been converted to some sort of living quarters, all of which have, uh, the majority of which have porches on the front of them. Um, and I wanted to note that the majority of the properties on that particular block, based upon appearance from what I was looking at, are also non-conforming in regarding to coverage. I mean, basically, they're concrete from front to back. Um, very little green space. Um, we actually, surprisingly, have more green space than what our, our neighbors do, um, in my opinion. Um, this property, by its very nature, is definitely non-conforming. There are actually three structures on this one particular parcel and a, a, a parking lot that wraps from uh, Congress Street all the way to, to High Street. Um, and in working with uh, Trent De Bruin with VSWC Architects, we thought the proposed design was the least invasive and the uh, most aesthetically pleasing to achieve what we're trying to uh, do, which is um, add that outside living space um, that we currently just don't have. And the intent of the work is to add value not only to that property, but also to the community. Is there any questions on the Well, that 4% extra that you are requesting, is that 4 by 10 area? I'm, I'm actually, a, I'm kind of confused that it was that significant, but I know everyone has different calculations on how they approach things, so I wasn't really going to question that. Um, the 4 foot by 10 foot area that, that I'm speaking of is basically the footprint of the balcony. And in all reality, if you were out, if we were out on the site today, you would see that there is a, actually a very large overhang of the existing building. And it's approximately including the gutters about two feet. So really what we're doing is only extending away from the building. Um, we are extending that four feet approximately, but really we're only extending two feet beyond the overhang of the actual structure. So this is a very minimal enhancement. Um, we're also proposing um, replacing the existing front porch stoop that is a common used entrance way um, and it's simply not large enough for use and practicality of any type of outside enjoyment for for the current tenants um, and then the third the third part that you can see I think it is labeled as number three is a simple overhang for apartment number three very minimal and uh, it's actually there's concrete underneath what we're proposing to cover anyways. So in my opinion, it, it already um, wouldn't add to the lot coverage, I guess, in my interpretation. Okay. Any questions from the board members? Is, is number four, is that going to be on the ground or off the ground? The balcony, like, is thing is labeled four and five, the balcony. What's your page the, number that you're looking at? Uh, A3, I think it's A3. <clears throat> The exterior renovation. Correct. We would we would have a permanent foundation underneath that, so it would it would reach to the ground. Yes. And you're only asking for um, this variance for one building. That is correct. Okay. Uh, we'll be doing some painting and things of that nature to the other buildings, but. Um, no, no changes to them from on the exterior. Does this change any fire code escape the, in the building you have does, already? Does it change the fire code? Any escape avenues? Well, for well actually, fire. this actually adds a, an additional exit route for the tenants. So instead of currently, they only have one entrance point. Uh, for each apartment. So these two apartments would actually have a, an additional exiting route. Um, if, 
if I answered your question correctly. Any other questions? Uh, there was only one thing I didn't quite understand. It says uh, the current and proposed porch is for circulation only. What is circulation? Correct. Because it's a shared use, okay. um, both tenants have to use that point of entry in order to access their apartments. Oh, okay. um, we didn't feel, we, we can't, you can't put any chairs or anything there uh, or anything of that nature. It's simply for, to access the property. It's not large enough for any other point. Um, no more questions? Well, you may sit down. I don't think there's anybody else in here to go to, or anyone is interested in opposition or in general commentary. <laughs> Unless it's Scott, do you want to say something back there? <laughs> um, we're going to close uh, the discussions from the floor and either discuss the case or maybe somebody can maybe make a... Uh, Motion. I'll move. Okay. I move to grant a variance to the property at 19 South Congress Street from ECC 221001 Table A schedule of bolt controls to allow remodeling of a building, resulting in 44% building lot coverage or 40% building lot coverage is the maximum allowed. Do we have a second? A second. John, second. Um, Let's go over the findings quickly. Is there exceptional or extraordinary circumstances or conditions applying to the property in question or to the intended use of the property that do not apply generally to other properties or classes or users in the same zone? See? Well, we could say it's a non-conforming property. Mm -hmm. Doesn't enjoy the benefits of, of the, the large Okay. Is there any practical difficulty in undue hardship that we could create by denying the variance? Uh, Always. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the preservation of equal property rights. I think other people in the neighborhood have the same rights. And I believe it is a minimum variance, 4%. Um, absence of detriment. There is none. Detriment. Yeah. And none of a general nature. No. no. Are we ready to vote? Yes. Those who want to grant this variance, please raise your hand. Okay. You have five to zero. You have the variance. Congratulations. You may need to contact the code office again to do the paperwork. Disposition of the minutes from December 10, 2019 meeting. Yeah, that was a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to the best of my knowledge, there was none. Uh, was there anything, Mr. Reschenbacher, that any of us contacted you regarding any changes? Okay. So, need a motion to approve the minutes of March for December of 2019. I move that we approve the minutes of December 10 of 2019. I second. Okay, all in favor of? Aye. Aye. I was okay. here. You got five to zero. <laughs> you were not here. We still have three votes. Okay, on the, every year in February, we reorganize, we select a new chair. Yeah. So at this point, we are going to accept any nomination or self-nomination. Anybody who wants to be the chair, please speak now or... I nominate you again. I second that. <laughs> okay. All in uh, favor of me to serve as a chair for one more year, please raise your hand. Can we go okay. six months, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it's been great to be the chair in here, and I'll be honored to serve for one more year. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. And now we have in here something we added to the agenda, a presentation by Ms. Uh, uh, Lisa Eliason, uh, the law director. And uh, it's all yours. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, and I, I appreciate the invitation to attend. I know I've talked with you before about public records law, the Sunshine Law, 
And I've provided you with two handouts. Uh, the handouts, first one is Ohio Sunshine Law and Ohio Ethics, and the second it just is entitled Board of Zoning Appeals Training, November 2019. We tried to do this back in November, but it didn't quite work out, so here I am tonight, and I'm glad to be here. So it's interesting in that um, although I've done uh, Sunshine Law training today, uh, we had Sunshine Lane. Sunshine Law Training for the City of Athens. The Auditor of State sent someone down, and it was a three-hour training. Uh, elected officials have to have Sunshine Law Training uh, during their term. And uh, City Council uh, can designate someone to serve in their stead. But uh, in this case, we had several City Council people who did attend. If you are just dying to have more information about uh, the Ohio Sunshine Law, you can take a three-hour course, and uh, that's offered by the Ohio Attorney General's Office. Uh, you have to, uh, every so often, uh, well, you have to answer questions, and at the end, you get a certificate. You have to move the mouse on your computer so they know you're still there. So uh, if you would like to do that. So I want to tell you some of the highlights. Uh, somebody before the meeting asked me if anything had changed, and it really hasn't. Um, but this is a public body, and I think that's important to remember. Uh, you're appointed. And any subcommittee that you would have would also be a public body. We've talked about that before, subject to the Sunshine Law. Um, and the Sunshine Law is, is named as such because all public business, business should be conducted in public, in the sunshine. And um, that's why we have the Sunshine Law. Uh, there are two parts to it. One part is open meetings, and the other part is public records. You're not really faced much with public records because uh, I believe that Mr. Ashenbacher keeps your minutes, and um, so you're not faced with that. However, um, there could be a, a time when there's a request made of you or perhaps a email communication. Uh, if somebody believes that you are discussing public business via email, there could be a request for your emails. Um, we've discussed that before. Um, so the public records law, uh, that applies to public records, but also the Sunshine Law uh, talks about what happens in your meetings. So in the Sunshine Law, everything that you do, all business has to be conducted in public. So if you were to have a subcommittee, those subcommittees couldn't meet in private. And in fact, you have to be very careful about not discussing the public business of the Board of Zoning Appeals um, in private. So let's say that uh, two of you decide that you're going to have lunch one day, and uh, that's something that's prearranged meeting. And if you're discussing the public business, um, it could be, although there are five of you, um, it has to be a majority, but it's an appearance that perhaps you are violating the Sunshine Law. So I'd be very careful of that. That doesn't mean that you can't, at a social gathering, you can't walk up to someone else and say, hey, how are you, and hello. Uh, but just be careful. And uh, that has happened, that uh, people have been seen in public uh, that are on committees, and people have questioned it. So um, a memo that's circulated or an email that's circulated if you get a, an email regarding the public business, uh, you should not respond to it. And usually, um, I think the best course of conduct is to state no response is needed. Certainly, you send information out, but uh, I don't know that I need to remind anyone about not responding because that could be a violation of the Sunshine Law if you're discussing the public business. Can I ask a question? Sure. I often get an email from public, uh, from especially the media, Mm -hmm. because I'm chair and my email is available. And they have a question about something, and I usually I respond because of courtesy to answering any email. But I never actually know the answer, so I refer them to the code office. Is that, do they continue doing that? Yes. Okay. However, that could be a public record. There could be a request okay. yeah. for your emails. Okay. And uh, just keep that in mind. Right. So... There are some statutory exceptions, uh, but most of those wouldn't apply here. Uh, we can go into, there, there are times when um, a public body can go into an executive session, and there are very specific exceptions. Um, I think last time when I talked to, to you, I found a court case that talked about deliberations 
were actually quasi-judicial. And I would prefer that your deliberations are in public, but uh, there was a court case that said that uh, it's quasi-judicial because you are really a quasi-judicial body. You give notice. Um, if um, there's a question of a public record, then the remedy are two. There could be a mandamus action, or uh, now you can file a complaint in the Court of Claims, and it's $25, and a mediator's appointed. So um, a violation of the Sunshine Law could be a civil lawsuit. And uh, today we learned that there was a school board that was completely removed from office for violating the Open Meetings Act. So uh, there were some court cases uh, that I've talked about before, just to be careful of, don't whisper, don't pass notes. I think that's pretty evident, but there are court cases, so obviously people have done it before. And um, again, just not responding to an email, uh, not to get into a conversation. Uh, around Robin, we, this was very, uh, this was well explained to us today, and round robin can result in a violation of the Sunshine Law open meetings. Round robin is, let's say there are three on a committee, and person A goes to person B and talks about public business, and person A goes to person C and talks about public business. That's round robin, and that could be a violation. And uh, Ohio ethics law, um, I think that um, as far as the ethics law, uh, violation of the ethics law is punishable by misdemeanor. Conflict of interest is very simple. Um, avoid the appearance of impropriety. And um, the way to think of a, a conflict of interest is very easy. Uh, if there's a direct pecuniary benefit to you or to a family member or to an associate, a business associate, then that would be a conflict of interest. So that was just the highlights. I mean, this went on for three hours today, and so I'm not going to uh, talk to you for three hours. Those were just the highlights. Um, more importantly, I, I brought another packet that I wanted to talk with you about because you probably think, okay, so what would happen after this? What if somebody doesn't like our decision? What happens next? So I thought that I would uh, talk to you about that. Um, basically, you probably already know where the law comes from, but the legal system, there's a federal and state system, and um, anything that would happen here would go up through the state system. So your decision could be appealed to the Common Pleas Court. Mm -hmm. Then the decision could be appealed to the Court of Appeals and finally to the Supreme Court. So yours is an administrative decision, and it could be appealed by someone who didn't like the decision, could be appealed to the Common Pleas Court, um, and, and on to the Court of Appeals. Um, in the Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals um, doesn't have the same power to weigh the evidence as the common police court has. The court of appeals really looks at if there's an error of law. So they're going to look at that. So what I thought I would do on page two, um, I went back through the Board of Zoning Appeals cases that made it up to the court of appeals. And I thought that that might be interesting to look at and see what we could take away from those cases. Um, usually planning commission, those don't go up through common pleas or court of appeals or any, any of our other boards or commissions. So you're the lucky ones. Uh, your decisions could be appealed. So the first one I found was a 1985 uh, decision. And um, that one was Moore versus the Board of Zoning Appeals. And it's interesting in that this is kind of historical, but in this case, um, Mr. Laughlin had a vending business. He applied for a zoning permit for remodeling. The permit was granted. Uh, he appealed, let's see, the permit was granted. But he uh, also wanted to expand uh, and pave his parking lot. He appealed to the Board of 
zoning appeals for the expanded parking. Now, an individual by the name of Moore, so he was a third party to this, he appealed and asked the Board of Zoning Appeals to reverse the permit and deny the parking. So the Board of Zoning Appeals reversed the zoning certificate on the remodel and gave uh, Mr. Laughlin 12 months for rezoning. So then Mr. Moore appealed, and he appealed to the Common Police Court because that's the next step. So what happened there was uh, the Common Police Court um, said no 12-month exception, and then Mr. Laughlin appealed to, to um, actually in that, Moore appealed the 12-month exception, Laughlin appealed uh, to the Common Police Court. Common Police Court said um, the entire ordinance was unconstitutional, but the Court of Appeals reversed it and reinstated the Board of Zoning Appeals decision. So that tells you how long and complicated things can be. Um, so then there was the case also in 1985, and again, um, this one is Kendall versus Bain, and that's Nancy Bain. We know her. Um, the zoning administrator denied um, uh, a situation for us. Oh, this was for this was on Stimson, mm -hmm. and uh, the zoning inspector refused the application for um, a convenience store in Stimson, and for the reason that underground gasoline tanks uh, cannot be located. Uh, cannot be located less than 200 feet from any R district. So um, in this case, it was the goods. They applied for a variance, and uh, there were two hearings. Residents um, testified, opposed the application. Experts testified. The board deliberated and granted a conditional use permit. Uh, Kendall's were the abutting neighbors, and they appealed to the Common Police Court. Common Police Court affirmed the decision of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Kendall's appealed again, and the Court of Appeals affirmed. So that just gives you an idea of how it, it goes through. The, the law of the case was the Board of Zoning Appeals has discretion to determine whether a variance or a conditional use permit should issue in any given case. So that was the law of that case. Uh, there's always something out of a case that you can pull out, and we call that the law of the case and you can use it for the future. Uh, back to the previous case, um, when they talked about uh, the constitutionality, of the previous case, which was on page three, the Moore case, that a municipality exercises its legislative function when it enacts comprehensive, comprehensive zoning code, and um, the code, unless it's uh, patently arbitrary and reasonable and without any relation to public health, safety, or morals, or general welfare is entitled to deference and a presumption of constitutionality. So uh, let's see. That takes us to um, the Hughes case. Now, that one was 1991. So the Hughes case, uh, Hughes received a zoning certificate for an apartment, but not parking on the right side of the structure. He went ahead and built the lot and applied for a variance. Uh, the Board of Zoning Appeal granted the variance but reduced the area. He appealed to the Common Pleas Court. The Common Pleas Court reversed, and the Court of Appeals affirmed the decision of the Common Pleas Court reversing. So the law of that case was the Court of Appeals does not have the power to weigh the evidence as is granted to a Common Pleas Court we can reverse the decision of the court only upon a determination that such court erred on a question of law. That's what I said before. They didn't look at the facts. They only looked at the issue of law. Mm -hmm. On 1995, a lot of people know this case, the Rothstein case, and um, that one had a long history. In 1988, there was a new mayor who decided to <laughs> enforce uh, the zoning regulation that no more than three tenants could reside in an R1 and R2 zone, and that would be strictly enforced. Uh, he applied, Rothstein applied to the Board of Zoning Appeals seeking a variance from the zoning ordinance. Uh, the BZA denied the request uh, because it did not meet your six criteria necessar necessary in order to qualify for a variance. He appealed to Common Police Court. Common Police Court said the actions of the city did not result in an unconstitutional taking. The judge found the BZA decision regarding five of the six criteria necessary to obtain a variance were um, 
unsupported by a, a preponderance of substantial, reliable, and probative evidence, and the BZA failed to satisfy the six because it was unconstitutionally vague. The court enjoined the city from enforcing the ordinance, so that was in the common police court. Well, then the BZA and the city appealed. The Court of Appeals reversed the judgment of the trial court, remanded the case for entry of judgment in favor of the city and the BZA. So that was kind of a long and complicated history that had a law of the case. And that one, again, is legislative acts are presumed constitutional. Uh, there was a case in 1997. So you can see there have been a lot of cases, um, nothing more recently than 2011. Uh, but in 1997, uh, this was SNL Enterprises versus City of Athens. And um, SNL sought a declaratory judgment against the city, alleging uh, he had the right to use a basement apartment that did not comply with window size because of the grandfather provisions. And they sought a writ of mandamus, a writ of mandamus. Uh, the Court of Common Pleas partially granted the declaratory judgment, finding the apartment could be lawfully used as a boarding house if SNL complied with the building code. The court concluded the procedure for SNL to challenge the window ordinance was to first submit the plans to the building inspector for approval and then litigate the issue. So SNL appealed. The uh, Court of Appeals have affirmed the decision of the Common Pleas Court. So, so that takes us up to three wide. And this is one that um, I really want to spend some time on. And um, anything you see here was uh, something that we do in law school. We, we brief the case. So you read a case. And I brought them all with me if anyone really has some strong desire to look at them. But uh, you read the case, and you brief it, and you talk about the facts, the issue, procedural history, um, and the conclusion, and what law you can, the law of the case that you can pull out. But sometimes the cases have more information than, um, some have more than others. And this one had quite a bit that I think will be helpful. I think people were aware of this one. So this was 2011, three wide filed for, filed an application for a zoning permit. The Board of Zoning Appeals denied it. Common Police Court found the BZA had applied the wrong standard in denying the permit and vacated the BZA decision, but stated it was not a judgment or reversal. BZA filed an appeal. The Court of Appeals held the proper scope of the board's review was limited to determining whether the company's proposed use of the pro property qualified as principal permitted use as specified in the zoning code, Title 23, and or qualified as the same general character as those specified uses. So the board in that case relied on um, other considerations. And instead of focusing only on what use, uses were allowed by the code, the BZA indicated its decision was largely on what kind of businesses were in the area. BZA was equally mistaken to the extent its decision was based on whether the proposed use was appropriate for the community. In addition to the inappropriate factors discussed and applied by the board, the transcript also contains some evidence the members of the BZA did not understand their role. So that's actual language from the Court of Appeals decision. So the court went on, and I just want to go through these. Um, there were more, but uh, just so that you know um, what could happen in a Court of Appeals and what the Court of Appeals well, the Common Police Court and what the Court of Appeals would look at. So the court listed a number of instances in which various board members seem to apply inapplicable standards, standards outside the scope of their review. OK, and here's some examples. Uh, number one, more than one BZA member expressed surprise and confusion that the board's duties encompassed more than handling variances. Number two, a member repeatedly referred to the immorality of the proposed use. Three, a member wrongly expressed the scope of the BZA review as determining whether three wides business, was, business would be similar to what concurrently, what is concurrently, currently, I'm sorry, in the neighborhood. Four, a member stated it was the BZA's job to determine what was appropriate for the community. And five, members referring to and applying standards relating to the granting of variances. So this is directly from the language of the case. But I, I thought this one was the most important for you to see um, as far as what the Court of Appeals looked at 
and uh, the findings of the Board of Zoning Appeals. And of course, you know, when the Court of Appeals uh, hears the case, they, they don't see witnesses. They only decide it on the paper documents. They have a transcript of the proceedings um, and um, the minutes. So here the question was whether three wides proposed use qualified as a principal permitted use as specified in the zoning code or qualified as the same general character. So the Court of Appeals affirmed the decision of the Court of Common Pleas. So they discussed kids in the neighborhood that this business would not be good because there's kids and stuff. Well, the immorality yeah. of yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, I just... We got a question. So sure. with the when it comes up with the BZA appealing to this, do you represent the BZA? Yes. Bar? Okay. I do. I do. So it goes to the city, city attorney. That's right. But the board is not to be present? or No, no. Okay. And um, in fact, it's all paper it's on paper. paper. It's whatever happened here. That's why it's very important for you to discuss uh, the findings that you have, your your factors that you have, and to uh, have a, a rationale mm -hmm. for that, because that's all we have later on, is the transcript of your rationale. So, yes, if there's a notice of appeal, then at that point, I step in and represent the Board of Zoning Appeals. At one point, a long time ago, we used to have a representative from your office sitting at one of our meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, and that put us on ease a little bit. And on so ease had, or uneasy? Uh, and, you know, it was easier to have somebody oh, to be right. advising us. But, uh, you know, if we have a case similar to that, we always contact you. Yes, you to, do. To have and I appreciate present. that. Yeah. Right. Anything else? So we've had a few. Uh, one, the woman who someone called in and got almost very personal with an appellate that someone seeking a variance got a little personal and um that was a little uneasy uh and i don't know how far well john would know how yeah. far to take that but uh, uh, well let's say that's... we have five days to change our decisions uh after this tonight's meeting um if the appellant comes in there without going to the court and wants to talk to us and maybe present more evidence. And if we set up a special meeting, could that be uh, a legal thing? Or, do, we, or do, they, do they have to go to the court and sue yeah, us? Yeah, I don't think that's in your rules. Okay. I don't think you have a provision for that. That would almost be a motion for reconsideration, but I don't recall seeing that in your rules. Oh, okay. so. But they do have a remedy, and that's to go through the court. Okay. Is it very expensive? For the city to have that happen? Not for the city, but a lot of times an appellant, in these cases, I believe that every one of them had an attorney representing them. Yeah. Is this something we can add to the rules uh, that if a case like that happens, so we can resolve it between us and the appellant without going through all Interesting. That? If there was new evidence, um, I don't know. I'll, I'll take a look at that and see if um, there could be a motion for reconsideration. Okay. In a trial court case, there is, mm -hmm. but I don't know. We can. I'll take a look at it for you. I'd be glad to. And you said our decision is not final for five days. Is yeah. that correct? Like the case we so, had tonight, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we all said yes, but we can change our decisions in five. We have five days to revise it if we need to. But you're saying what your your question is? If an appellant yeah. says to you. Um, I have additional information. Right. Okay. Or something maybe we misunderstood or or the appellant didn't get a chance to elaborate anymore, so maybe we can get together and and maybe a result. Okay, well, I'm glad to look at that. Okay. We've had a couple of cases where the board's made a decision and someone, after they've made the decision, said, no, wait, that's wrong. I've got, I didn't get to testify. I didn't yeah, that was my next question. Like, what happens when that... Up. Well, in that case, in that particular case that I remember, the reason he was protesting was he said he didn't get properly notified. Mm -hmm. and we found out later he had four different addresses, so I, you know, I sent it to one of them. But anyway, the board decided that 
his request or his complaint was enough to have it heard again at the next meeting. They didn't have a special meeting. Mm -hmm. Just tagged it on to the next meeting that was there and had him speak his piece. Is that okay? Yes, I actually think I remember that situation. I yeah. think I was probably consulted on that. So the so the the ruling had to be paused until. Well, they they made the ruling. They, what happened was this guy wanted to add a, a a deck to his house that was too close to the property line. The guy who owned that property, the neighboring property, said he wasn't notified, so he wasn't at that meeting. Mm -hmm. The board found to go ahead and build the the deck. He said, "No, wait, wait. I didn't get a chance to testify and stuff." So the board granted him the right to say his piece, and I believe they kept the same decision. But the other thing I wanted to ask, which has come up a couple times, it hasn't come up too much lately, is if we have a, a witness come up and they just trash talk the appellant, mm. you can't grant this, this guy's no good, he's dishonest, he or she can't be trusted. Eventually, Mr. Golsey will say, well, we're not here to discuss the character of this stuff. If another witness comes up and says, well, I want to refute that. This guy's a great guy. That What that guy said is wrong. Now, what does Mr. Golsey do? Does he just say, no, we can't, you can't That's go back both agree. ways? Or? Well, I think he's already said that we're not here to judge the character of the person. But if somebody comes up and says, well, I, you know, I, I, but that's not fair that all he got was trash talked. I want to say the good things about the appellant so the board has a more balanced view of the appellant. Would Mr. Golsey be within his rights to do that? I think that's within his discretion okay. as the board chair. And if during the five days, one or two or more of us have some, you know, second thoughts about how we um, voted, do we need another public hearing? Yes. So, so you they inform the, the chair and then we set up a special meeting, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we got notified the appellant, correct? 11, okay. Mm -hmm. Notify everybody. Right. Yeah. I think most of our cases in the late uh, lately has been all unanimous, pretty much. Mm. Yeah, they've been pretty calm lately. <laughs> but again, you wouldn't <laughs> right. You wouldn't have discussion that violates right. the sunshine law. Yeah. Right. Um, if somebody has second thoughts on um, how they voted, they would contact the chair and not have discussion amongst yourselves. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of specific questions about these two cases, a couple of the cases. Do I need to ask now or can I ask you afterward? You can ask me afterwards. Okay, thanks. And let's say if I ask John and Kay maybe to get together and review the rules of procedures of the board, uh, those two should not be working together privately, right? Well, you have five people on your mm -hmm. board. and Plus two alternates. Plus the alternates, but again, it's just five people okay. on the board. Uh, two people working together would be okay. Uh, three people is not. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Oh, you Appreciate welcome. your uh, time and. So do we get our certificates now in the mail? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. if, you could, if you take that three-hour um, sunshine watch, you get a nice certificate from the Attorney General. Is there anything else we need to discuss? No? So we adjourn. No.